So I'm here uh, uploading videos. Um, tomorrow we will go meet Joe Newell. And I can't wait to... Uh, Oh man, that's so out of focus. So I'm here at Kenny's brother's house, CL, um, in uh, Clay Center, Kansas. They've graciously lent me this room to sleep in. Awesome hospitality by Kenny's brother. I'm uploading uh, some of the videos onto my uh, computer here and we will see you guys tomorrow in the morning to meet Mr. Joe Newell. I met Kenny at Clicks Billiards in Austin, Texas. He showed up one day and watched us play on a 9 foot Brunswick. He introduced himself to us and really showed interest in our playing ability. I asked him if he would like to play his eyes lit up, a grin grew from ear to ear, and he responded with, I think I'll just watch. Kenny made me feel larger than life. I could see in his eyes that he really enjoyed the same passion we enjoyed, playing pool. Kenny grew up in Clay Center, Kansas, with a man named Joe Newell. Joe ended up becoming Brunswick's lead historian. Kenny asked me if I would like to take a trip up to Kansas to meet Joe, knowing how much I love billiards. Of course, I said yes. I picked up my newly purchased Sony camcorder and headed out to make a documentary. I had never made a documentary before. So I got in my Tahoe and headed to Denton, Texas. It's a city located right outside Dallas. I caught up with Kenny at a local pool hall called JR Pockets. There he would tell me more about Mr. Joe Newell and also about his life, you know, growing up in Kansas. He'd also tell me more about playing snooker and what pool was like back then. Kenny was no spring chicken. He was 72 years old and pool had sure changed a lot from when he grew up till today. One thing that hadn't changed were people were still having lots of fun playing pool. JR Pockets was one prime example. It was located right outside of Dallas, Texas. I had been there before when I was truck driving. I had stopped in at a local truck stop and took an Uber. There I met a lot of cool people, a lot of nice people. Even one of the top players in the US who plays there, his name's Jeremy Jones. So many cool people there and so many fun times. I was excited to meet up with Kenny and talk about where we were going and who we were about to meet. I had really no clue who Joe Newell was, but I was very excited to get to meet him. This is our trip. This is our documentary. Our trip to meet Mr. Joe Newell. It's a nice setup. Yeah. So, do you remember the day that we met each other? It was at Clicks, and I I don't remember. Yeah, I kind of remember. The first memory I have of you is you were watching me, maybe me and Drew play or something. That's right. That's correct. I mean, we asked you to play, but you didn't want to play. <laughs> I was intimidated. Yeah. Very, you know, because I, I mean, I'm still, I, I'll, I'll play, but uh, I, I know my, I know who can play and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, you got to be, able to play, to be able to play with the big dogs, you know. Although you guys so were- So did you enjoy watching us? I felt like oh, you enjoyed yeah. watching us. Oh yeah, oh absolutely. 
I yeah. Like, I thought it was kind of weird. I was like, man, we got a spectator, a fan. Which you, you oh, like, yeah. No. So I'm, you played, you started playing pool when you were younger. You said you played Probably snooker. 10, 10 or 11. Yeah. And uh, the Newell was the guy that he was the postman that would buy a lot of the pool tables and, and uh, he ran the local pool hall. But yeah, I started hanging Clay out Center. there in Clay Center where we're going. Yes. Is that where you're from? Are you from Clay Center? I am from Clay Center. That's where I grew up. Yes. Grew up in the yeah, in the town. All, I was there all my my life until I went in the service at uh, 17. So you know the, the, the okay. So this guy he, and he ran a pool hall. What was the pool hall? There? It was. It's still the name Idle Hour, the Idle Hour. Yeah, and a lot of the farmers used to come in, and uh, they would play. It was uh, very uh, pretty much in the center of town, but all the farmers used to come in you know when they weren't especially during the uh during the winter months they they would have uh a lot of uh, a lot of games of pinochle and and pool going on and so the the pool hall has really changed because you know the 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 old guys and this is something i don't really know why it, it's changed, but maybe farming has changed because prop, the remember the things I remember about the pool hall was there was a lot of lot of farmers that were in there. Money was a lot different, you know, 40 years ago. We would play, there was a lot of change. So what I remember Golf used to be the gambling game. First table, as it was set up, was a b billiards. And so a few of the players played billiards. The best billiards player was the, the Newell. He was always the best one. And, you know, he, and they played three cushion billiards. But then the second was the golf table, where usually it would be uh, there would be seven guys that would play in it, one through through seven, because that would be the on the, and it being a, a snooker table, you could do the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh spot would be devoted to balls. There'd be seven balls, the highest in snooker. The scratches, as I remember, the typical games was a quarter scratch. Yeah. and maybe dollar for the so if you won then you would collect on everyone's scratches and and uh and also the dollar for you know that everyone would pay when you were 17 you said you left clay to left clay center for the for did the you navy ever go back to playing pool or seeing being around pool i i did you know i i played in the service and they had what seven footers a lot of seven footers and so i always did well you know playing with with other other guys on seven seven foot tables there was some gambling that went on i i remember there was a lot of cash and uh i was probably one of the better players but you know and then when i went to florida when I was in Florida, made a few extra dollars playing there. And I played, when I was in South Carolina, I played, uh, I played a lot when I was in, at the college. They had, uh, you know, a number of tables and downtown in Columbia, South Carolina. So I played a lot of, t a lot of pool in downtown Columbia, South Carolina. Snooker was still a big game in grown up in the in the in the 70s when I was in in Columbia it still was you know now obviously pool 
pool doesn't uh, doesn't include snooker in most of the games now. Probably 90% of the pool tables, or maybe 95, are, are are pool tables, not not billiard tables or or snooker tables anymore. Okay, so how did we come about to going up to meet Joe Newell to uh, uh, interview him? Uh, I just I knew that that uh, that Joe, being the uh, Brunswick historian, would be um, and having known his father and and known that they do the the major um, celebrities uh, tables all around the country in the U.S. from Nicholas to you know all of the the Camp David tables that they've they've furnished over the years in the White House I knew that that would be a, a very good opportunity for pool players to see you know the old the old tables if Joe was willing to share the time with you and fortunately he he was he says he doesn't do many interviews anymore because he just he says he doesn't he's not interested in promoting any of his product any longer well I can't wait to go up to meet him and it it will be it will be exciting, and uh, so we'll see some some really fantastic tables from many years ago. Awesome! Awesome! <laughs> awesome! <laughs> That's it. So with that, we were headed off on our ten-hour trip. We're headed to Clay Center, Kansas. So we're going to be meeting with Mr. Joe Newell of Brunswick Story. Now we knew a little bit more about Joe Newell. And we also knew a little bit more about Kenny's history growing up in Clay Center. We headed off, but first we would stop into Jamaica Joe's Pool Hall in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Just like the pool hall, the idle hour that Kenny had told me about, Jamaica Joe's was famous for having some of the best players around. All of the farmers gathering during the winter seasons made my imagination run wild with all the amazing stories that must have been going through that place. There must have been just an endless amount of crazy colorful characters having awesome times during the winter seasons. They must have all been gathered around those Brunswick tables, all having endless, endless hours of fun and enjoyment. Such an amazing thought just to think that that company, Brunswick, brought so many smiles to so many Americans for so many generations across the years. Now, we were going to get a chance to meet Joe Newell, the historian for Brunswick, so that he could teach us a little bit more about Brunswick and their history with the game of billiards. But first, we would cross over the great Oklahoma Plains. The scenery was absolutely breathtaking. This wasn't the first time I had seen Oklahoma. I had actually seen it many times. Once as a young child with my father, when he moved our family to Norman, Oklahoma so that he could attend college there at the University of Oklahoma. And also many times driving trucks. As an 18-wheeler driver, we got to see so much of the country. Joseph? Yeah. I'm Tell him I'm driving. Okay. Oh man, we're coming to a complete stop here. What's going on? He could easily sell the house for four million and oh, wow. you're gonna get three and he's gonna get more. So we're here with Kenny. Uh, we're passing the Oklahoma border. And as you can see, it's gorgeous. The birds are chirping. And 
there it is. There's where we're heading. That's Oklahoma. Jamaica Joe's. We're headed to Jamaica Joe's. All right, we're here with Kenny and we're uh, arrived in Oklahoma City. All right. Not Tulsa, not Norman, Midwest City. This is Oklahoma next, City, right? Next to Midwest City, next to Oklahoma City. Okay. And what were you saying? There's a base here close. Big military base in Midwest City. And I'm presuming it's an army base, but I'm not sure. Yeah. We will ask. Nice. Which the tables, um, like underneath the tables, there's yeah. hooks, so you can hang like your there's case the, um, or your purse. There's the snooker table oh, way back there. Under the table. Oh, and nice. yeah. They got a full, it's a, what is it, China, China's a star? Chinese star. Chinese star of uh, snooker table back there. Uh, 12 footer and there's some nine foots right here. The room looks so big here And they got crazy amount of um, Seating Oh, we get a free hour with lunch here so because this is awesome Okay, this is really cool So there's Kenny and we're on our way to uh, Clay Center, Kansas, to meet Joe Newell, um, Brunswick uh, table mechanic. Um, and here's the bar, and there's the menu at top. If you're hungry, there's the menu. Sooner Nation, baby. Wow, crazy. Oh, look at these cool. You get these cool utensils on these big tables. Yeah, this is the biggest, this is the biggest snooker table I've seen. This is a regulation here. No, 12. I was very surprised to see that nobody was here at the pool hall. It was yeah. kind of a sad reflection of the times of the state of billiards, and it was clear to see that pool was a dying All art. Right. Kenny's gonna say so grace before we left, <laughs> we chowed down on some pool hall food and spoke with Brian, one of the locals. Right. The question I have is, and I know it was in, in Kansas that there, there was way more snooker tables than pool tables but when did that start to change that that would be the question the pool's been fading out for a while i know I mean, but, so. but let's say the pool halls when they made the transition mm -hmm. from snooker tables to pool I, I you know i can see it from an economical standpoint it it seemed like it's a less interesting game it is yes. you know it's a slow game I it's mean, a slow game it's a very yeah. slow game yeah. And eight ball seems to be um, even a you know, more instant reward than, than yeah. nine ball because yeah. you know uh, I don't know, but I and one I, I start coming to Oklahoma actually ruined my game. I dropped about two balls uh, coming to Oklahoma, and the reason why is I came from Texas, so the smallest table I played on was an eight footer. And an eight foot, nine foot, man, I used to have a beautiful long stroke. And then I came to Oklahoma, started playing on these. You can't, you, there's very few, with the size of the table, you don't need a long stroke, you know? The, the JR Pockets is, is a good, and they have a Tuesday night game that uh, Jeremy Jones plays there a lot. Oh, okay, and, yeah. And, and, He's and, coming uh, here quite often. We just, he does come in. He's yeah. coming here very yeah. often. For he's yeah. here for when we have our five thousand dollar item tournaments yeah. and stuff. Yeah, he's oh, he's one of those. This this okay. last Wednesday, uh, Efren Reyes. They brought in Efren Reyes. Oh, nice. And 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 he played Jeremy, oh. and Efren was just 
uh, I I made some some shots of it, and he just he's, he he was an amazing player. Lots of respect for Efren. I wish I played even a tenth this as good as he did. <laughs> See, yeah, back when we I started playing, that's how it did, but that ladder has gone away. It's like, I don't know, it's like, when I learned, I lost a lot of money to, to, you know, but then when I got better, I played the lower players one month, and I went to play higher players and then lost my money, but there's no lower players wanting to donate to get better hardly anymore, you know, and it's yeah. not like I'm saying, hey, come in and lose 100 bucks to me every day. You play for five, exactly. play for well, 10. Exactly, I do a lot of $5, $10 sets with the lower player that With way. a spot. With a spot, so I, I'm getting my practice in there, getting, but man, a lot of them are like, I still can't win, so it's like, well, we're playing for ten dollars a set. If we play for free, I just start banging balls about them. Yeah. I mean, I don't care if we even play a race to five for a shot, but there's got to be something. Play for something, yeah. Yeah. At the end, <clears throat> that increases your focus. That increases, you know, the, how rapidly you learn. Because I lost about four thousand dollars at like two dollars a game in three months. <laughs> you know, that's how bad when I first started playing. I wanted to learn how to play the game. I've worked here off and on for 10 years. I have not seen but like six people set up drills and and practice in my t entire 10 years. I mean, and for me, it was set up drills all the time. I come in, I practice, guess what? I set up drills or practice on shots I was having trouble with. Now people just rack the balls and, and just bang them bone. They say, that's my practice. I'm like, what'd you learn? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Are you still missing the exact same shot you've missed 10 times in a row? And you're still missing the shape on that shot? They're like, well, yeah. I'm like, then you didn't get any practice in. <laughs> All you're doing is banging balls about. <laughs> Gambling's kind of gone down a lot. So Tournaments y'all still do yeah, regularly? The only time we see the big, big players anymore are really the tournaments or unless they match up online first and then they come down here for a match. But it's not like when, yeah, we, you used to be able to just walk into the pool hall and find seven people sitting there and pick up a game. People don't do that anymore. They don't even come out to sit in the pool hall anymore. To, to even really watch. It, yeah, because there's nothing watch. to watch. It's basically, hey, the only time they come down is like when we're streaming a big tournament or something or they've matched up online. But there's no hardly any more, hey, I'm going to sit here, watch people play, and then people walk in, and then you can pick up a game. It's, it's been a weird time for pool the last 20, 30 years. It really has. I mean, it's more, it's not looked at as a sport. It's more looked at as recreational in the U.S. Whereas, that's why I said we get creamed in Mexico because that's our attitude. It's more recreational, whereas Europe is still looking at it as a sport. Four. <laughs> you know, they train, they practice, they play on the big tables, they do drills, they, you know, and that's what irritates me the most. I see a four speed come in here, say, I want to get better. You take the time to show them what you did, your training regimen, and then they don't ever do it. And then it's like, I just wasted my breath in half an hour or 45 minutes with you. Why, they, why am I going to do that? Whereas, you know, if I met you 20 years ago, I've seen you shot pool. Be like, how do you get, how, how do you do that? How do you get, and then you would tell me, and then I, immediately, I would go to the table and go practice what you, what you told me. Immediately, and then the next couple days, that's all I would do, so I would get it done. None of that anymore. <laughs> the pool, it's, yeah. it's certainly not about the money mm -mm. aspect is not there to make a career, because you no. might be, I mean, you have to be exceptionally good or and talented to make money consistently at pool. Yeah. I, I mean, it, yeah. it's, I don't know, because you always have to invest money, like even for a tournament. I got to invest $200 to try and make, make this money, you, you know? That's why a lot of people don't like that, and we run a lot more $20 and $50, because a lot more of the lower level players are willing to lose 20 or 50 rather than 100 to 200, <laughs> you know, for the entry fee and makes 
I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like open tournaments. I'm just used to you either win or you lose. And that's what I'm saying. The people, I don't know, I can't say everybody, but a lot of people just seem scared about the luck. They won't step up to a higher player and consistently play him to get better because they don't want to lose anything. But it's like, you have to lose something to get better. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But yeah, pool is just a changing world and it needs a kickstart <laughs> again. <laughs> Getting to meet Brian at Jamaica Joe's was a really cool experience. He really gave me an insight into what it was like to try to be a pool player in today's day and age. I guess it was different back then when cash was running around and there really wasn't credit cards and internet to where people could actually make a living on the road as pool players. Now. If you wanted to play pool, it was for recreational. But there was nothing wrong with that. We all loved to play pool, and so we still did. With that in mind, we headed up to Clay Center, Kansas to meet Mr. Joe Newell, historian for Brunswick Billiards. We had a lot of questions, like where were we going? And can he have any money on his debit card? Not really sure, but we made our way up to Play Center, Kansas at a nice little pace and we had fun enjoying the people and seeing the sceneries along the way. Do you have any childhood memories of being up here in uh, Kansas? Oh, quite a few. Um, in this in this area, I didn't spend that much time, but we, uh, as a family, went more east of here, which would be Manhattan. Uh, also where my mom grew up in Netawaka, Kansas. That's near, closer to Topeka, the state capital, north of there. So, a lot of memories there. And uh, one time, my, I guess my biggest, I considered accomplishment. I, I, I took my bicycle when I was 13 and I, I rode to, Netawaka where my mother grew up and that was a hundred mile trip on my bicycle one day and so I left around seven in the morning and got there at seven at night but it was in, a, in an area that would have been a little more hilly than this but it was all on two lane highway and, and uh, did, it, did it one day so I I think everyone would have thought I was crazy for doing doing it during the time that people weren't doing much on their bikes as far as trips by myself. That's, so that's one thing. Kenny and his crazy bike trip. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was looking at it. It was now, it was insane because, you know, usually people prepare for a, a, a breakdown, but I didn't prepare for a breakdown like a flat tire or anything like that, an extra two. I just assumed that everything would work out, which it did. Pure faith. It must have been. must have been. Kenny, tell us what it's like growing up in Kansas. Ooh. Well, it's a 
lot of a lot of beautiful um, pasture land like we're seeing now. A lot of farmland. Not, not many cities were coming up on a, one of the small towns. Abilene. Abilene is uh, the birthplace of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And, and then uh, it's followed by Clay Center. So there's a lot of miles and miles and miles of, of pasture land in between. food out here, Kenny, or are we going to have to cut our own chicken heads off? <laughs> What's for dinner? Squirrel? <laughs> Raccoon. Coon and possum. <laughs> this company built a lot of houses out here? Yeah, well, they're modular houses, I think. So one of the really good modular house companies and they they have locations in several several places but they started in Clay Center so this is it Kenny's home this is it now on the right that's the courthouse in the background. But uh, on the right, that, that's one of the um, manufacturing companies, Gilbert, Gilmore and Taji. And on the right here, that's the band shell that we played a lot of concerts in. Man. The band shell? Yeah, cool. With the silver? Yeah. We'll, we'll drive right by it so we can get it. And we had a benefit for my mother that raised a lot of money to start this, that kids park right there with all the kids play equipment. So that, that band shell was built during the, the uh, WPA times. So they have concerts there every, during the summer, every Wednesday. My brother is the director of the band. It's a municipal band, so both students and and uh, folks that you know are up to my age, I think. Some of them older. That's the Carnegie. So this is the one, the one pool hall in town, the Idle Hour. Oh, cool. <laughs> the one pool hall in town. Yeah, the one remaining. Idle Hour. Yeah. That's the local newspaper. It's a daily, and my, one of my classmates has carried on. His father owned it, and he's now the owner, the Dispatch. Place Center Dispatch. Really nice Baptist church. My mother used to play piano there and the choir. And then this is a Methodist church and she also, we grew up in the Methodist church right there. And uh, play, 
played directed the choir choirs there. I I grow I can take you the one I grew up in I can take you by tomorrow. Because it's a pretty Is this where your brother lives? He lives right we're about three houses away from him. But uh So we're we're close. This is We are here, this White House right here. This is his it may not be home. He didn't think that but I see uh they sometimes take his truck, so they must not be home. So here we are in Kenny's brother's, what's your brother's name, Kenny? CL. CL? CL, yeah. CL is Kenny's brother and we're in his backyard. He's got a, one of the most beautiful backyards I've ever seen. Everything this summer is so green because it's rained. Um, the, the rivers have overflowed and uh, everything is as green as we've seen it in many years not only in Austin, but um, around the U.S. Beautiful. And out here, if you can believe it or not, is a huge frog. I gotta show you guys this frog here. One of the most beautiful things I've seen in Kansas. Look at the size on that bad boy. He's sleeping. Sleeping frog. And, and ko uh, the koi fish. Yeah, the, we're gonna get a shot of the koi fish here. Kenny says the koi fish have grown. And they're showing uh, promise in their girth. And they're here to show off for us. As you can see, it's a fight of who is prettier. And they're all in the running. Looks like they enjoy their backyard here. So we finally made it to uh, Clay Center, Kansas. So I'm here uh, uploading videos. Um, tomorrow we will go meet Joe Newell. And I can't wait to uh, oh man, that's so out of focus. So I'm here at Kenny's brother's house, CL, um, in uh, Clay Center, Kansas. They graciously Lent me this room to sleep in. Awesome hospitality by Kenny's brother. I'm uploading uh, some of the videos onto my uh, computer here. And we will see you guys tomorrow in the morning to meet Mr. Joe Newell. Okay, today is Saturday, June 1st, 2019. We are in Timbuktu, Kansas. <laughs> We're headed to go see Joe Newell, right? Yes. Kenny knows where his farm is his farm is hidden at, the secret location. So he'll be taking us the back roads. So is this the road he lives on? Yes. Oh, that's his house back there. Oh, look at that little hay guy. <laughs> Woo! That's Joe back there with the lamp. You see him already? 
Eddie Kenny, you see that far? Yeah. Oh, he's got the swans. Hey, Joe. Hey. How you doing? I don't know. I'm trying to fix a bird feeder. Oh, <laughs> good to see you. Yeah. And this is Manny. Manny. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good. All right. Park it there. Well, you know what? Come on. We're going to sit in the barn where it's cool. Okay, for a back while. here. Come on. Yeah, no. Come on down there. Park. Bring down. Drive down there. He said, drive down where? So how much younger is Joe than you, or uh, the same age? A year younger, I think. Did y'all know each other in high school and stuff? Yeah, not that. He was a year behind, and we kind of hung around with our own. Right. Is it? Well, it seems beautiful to me. Oh, no. This is the last two days, the first two days, we've been able to mow. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, so, I, it takes us eight hours to mow and trim Oh, all man. So, yeah. you have just a, a big yard mower that you... That John you Deere mower. Do yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, you can't... We've, well, we've landscaped it to the point that you can't use even a tractor mower anymore. But that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Come on, let's, let's go in here where it's cool. That's I can go this way to... World. I don't know, I guess they got hungry. Man, they tore Gloria's feeder all apart. So she said, what? we can fix that. And I said, okay. Well, this is beautiful. So, did, was this a farm in the family? Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, so, well, you guys, you can get pie door to door. I mean, go, come on in. Uh, Gloria's dad. Gloria has, Gloria has a younger sister. She at the door. This, I don't know where you want to sit. Let's sit somewhere country. Oh, it smells like wood in here. Huh? It smells a lot like wood in well, here. Well, it should. <laughs> it took me eight years to build this place. But anyway, um, Gloria's, Gloria had an older sister. So Gloria had no brothers. And this actually was a dairy. And uh, we had to take tear the dairy barn down because the milk guy years before we moved back backed into it and it was falling down so they had a huge milk barn over there and anyway so we met when we were 13 so i started helping her dad farm uh, so this was a farm that actually you know i don't know if i helped take care of it but i just he would he would get off the tractor and go milk and i'd get on the tractor and do the field work for him Tell me her dad again. Her dad, her dad, her mom and dad was Sievert and Irene Grinnell. Okay, yeah. They yeah. were sweet, great people. Yeah. And they just kind of accepted me as a son. And, uh, you know, I worked out here and we kind of, she was, she's the same age as I am in our, in our class. And we just, when we went to high school, we started dating. You graduated in 65. 66. 66. Yeah, graduated in 66 from Clay Center, and then I graduated from, we, well, we went to college together. We graduated from college in 70. But uh, anyway, Gloria's dad, uh, you know, we went, dated four years of high school and two years of college. Gloria's folks sent, she went to K-State. I that. Yeah. And I went to Bethany because, you know, my folks couldn't afford to send it to school. And Were I had you a an athlete at ben Bethany? Yeah. I, I mean, I had a scholarship to play basketball. Okay, I, I didn't remember if it was basketball or football. Greg, my, I have a younger brother by 15 months. It's one year. He played yeah. college football four years. At Bethany, too. We both at Bethany. Bethany. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's great. It, it, yeah, you know, because... And so anyway, we, Gory's folks and my folks said, we dated four years of high school, and they said, you guys can't go to college together. You know, you need to find out if you really love each other enough to get married or stick it out. So... We said, okay. So Gory went to K-State for a year, or her sister did. And then I went to Bethany, and then we finally convinced them after a year, Gory got to transfer to Bethany. And then, so we got married between our sophomore and junior year of college. 
And then we stayed at, at Bethany for uh, three years after we graduated. I was director of financial aid and Gloria student taught student teachers. And then uh, a couple of the guys they played basketball with at Bethany, they went to work for a Xerox Corporation in Wichita. And Lindsburg was okay, nice community, but we thought this is not where we want to end up. So I went and interviewed, they convinced me to come down and interview, and I interviewed, they hired me. So I was a systems rep for nine years for Xerox Corporation. And, or, but anyway, you know, uh, we didn't have kids, so finally right. we, uh, we adopted, adopted. We, had ben, we adopted Ben. Okay. That's, our, that's our oldest son, well, okay. I have one son. He's a doctor, he's an a, a, um, anesthesiologist in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, and then Heidi we adopted, mm -hmm. and then we always told them once you are, turn 18 get graduate from high school, if you want to find your birth parents, we will help you. And so we did. It's beautiful. Oh yeah. Well, you know what I say, if it's made out of wood, I can make it. You don't want me making, working on machinery or mechanical stuff or electronics <laughs> because I'd break it. But wood I can repair. But uh, <laughs> this was a granary. When, when I worked for Glory's dad, uh, you know, back in the early 60s, there was two big huge doors one there and one there and you actually this set a dirt floor you drove through here and we dropped the grain and an auger took it upstairs into the bins and uh Gory's folks always said you know if you uh if you ever move back uh Gory's dad had two farms he said joe this is your farm this is what you're going to inherit because you know more about this and you know you tore down the fences you fixed the fences and whatever and so uh I'd been with, like I say, with uh, Xerox for 10 years and we just didn't want to raise our kids in the big city. And they were getting ready to transfer me to West Virginia. And then I said, I'm not gonna live on the East Coast. So we quit and moved back here and, and wasn't sure what we were gonna do. And I helped Gloria's dad and then I helped my dad in town, the antique store and stuff. And he was doing tables along with my grandfather. So I actually like to tell people I'm third generation. Sounds good. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I was nine years old, they set me on a stool in the shop and said, somebody's going to learn the history of billiards in, in Brunswick. And I, I said, well, why me? Well, I was the oldest son and the oldest grandson that was here. And so, and I hated I it. I that. hated it. I mean, I thought, why am I learning all this stuff? I want to know, did you bring your cue? He did. All right. We, we bought a cue on the way. We didn't bring, I didn't bring any of my cues. Because, uh... I say, Mark, a player from Washington, D.C., just spent three days here last week, and he just said, Joe, you don't even have a pool table set up. And I said, I work on them. I, when I set them up, then I get to play on them. And he said, isn't there an antique table? So I said, you know what? Come on. So we went in and ate lunch. We can do that, too. Went into Dad's old pool hall. There's still three antique tables in there. <laughs> oh. And we, he and I, he had never played golf. He'd oh. never played snooker. And I said, you're a player? And I don't, I don't know if he's ranked anymore, but uh, he... What's his he, full name? Oh, Mark. Mark. You know what? I wonder if he's been sending me texts. But he said he wants to bring his life out here. Because, you know, if you live in the city, being out here, he sat out on the back of the deck and watched the stars. <laughs> but anyway, um, I get it. When we go in the house, I get it. But, uh, and that's one of the reasons, well, we really did the barn for our family. We've got nine grandkids, and they come out here and spend the summer, and we got a little old farmhouse. We got nowhere to put them. So if you go upstairs, there's six beds. And uh, and then it's, it's worked out well for people that want to come. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time with uh, people anymore in, in advertising and interviewing. When you get a certain, I don't know, you're not 70, I'm over 70. I said, when you get that. I'm, I'm way over 70. You are? I'm 72. I, I was 64, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I told uh, the last time I, we had a meeting and I talked, I said, you know, you guys, you, they said, Joe, are we embarrassing? I said, you can't embarrass me. And I don't have to impress you, you know, I only got one person that I have to answer to and that's God. So I said, you know what, uh, take your best shot, you know. Uh, and you know, my dad, every time I would go somewhere, because we had been so privileged and blessed, go somewhere, you know, he would call up the Valentine and they'd come over and interview me and they'd put it in the paper and so, and it just, I, I quit doing that. I wrote for Pool and Billiard for nine years too, and every time a monthly article came out on antiques, I'd get you know three or four calls, and everybody wants to argue. You know, <laughs> some people yeah. did, and I just thought, you know, it's not worth the. Argument. I know what I can do, and and you know, it's a life that I've got to live. So you know, I, 
we quit doing that. This, this is, so this is the shop. Um, and Kenny, you talked about uh, Dad's slow pitch teams. Yes. When I was my dad's power attorney, and uh, you know I was his legal stuff and everything, so I was I got to divvy up everything. That's my dad's bat. Really? That we used all through. Oh man, thirty years of playing ball. This wow. is one I used. Wow. I don't know if the other guys saved theirs, but Dad had Dad had saved all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, he was still pitching into his fifties, uh, and so I told my brother, I said, "You know what? I give you a couple, and I'll take a couple." And so he got his, and Dad had a couple bats. Uh, so that that's my background. But this is this is the where I do everything, literally. Now, Derek Tears, we have a finish room in town, and he does that for me. But this is. Uh, this is where I do it. I'm getting ready to start. You guys will get a kick out of this. And this is this is Dad Low. Yeah, I believe when boy when, when we were uh, we did things together for a long time. That bar actually went to Tyler, Texas. Brunswick had a division uh, that did saloon fixtures, car tables. In fact, there's one in the in the barn. And is this you bar. and the cowboy hat? Yeah. Okay. That was probably in 83, 84. Okay. Uh, Dad says, I, I don't have the, the ability and the manpower to do back bars. And when Brunswick approached me, they said, you know, we've got some museums that have back bars and we've got, you know, some back bar stuff. And I said, well, okay. So that was, I think that was the second back bar we did. The other one went, the first one I did went to an NBA basketball player, Danny Shea. He's retired. Mm -hmm. In Orlando mm -hmm. Magic, I put the back bar up in there, and then actually bought a table for me too. But that was the first back bar that Dad and I did together. Uh, I played with uh, my. I never knew Willie Hoppy. Of course, he. Yeah, I was alive when he was before he died. My dad did, but I, I played pool with Willie Moscone, and I have a. He signed a thing for me, and um, Ava Lawrence. Of course, she's on the Brunswick staff. It was Ava Mattia at that point. Uh, and then I babysit with Jimmy Karras for a whole weekend one time, and we played. Who is that gentleman? Because I saw his picture up there. Yeah. Oh, you, you. If you're a player, and that's that's what's happened. Uh, do you know who Ava Mattia Lawrence is? Okay, I I I know kind of know who that lady is, and I kind of for a have... long time she was ranked number one. They call her the Swedish princess or the Swedish queen. This is this is Ava, and then like she was on staff. I haven't talked to her for quite a while. I don't know if she's still ranked or not she's in uh south carolina north carolina okay i bet you she's still playing there is this gentleman from new york the one because i recognize this name this is jimmy Karras. he was a world champion for a long time he kind of took after willie hoppy and willie moscone and he he died oh guys see this was in 95 and he died you know maybe about 10 years ago but he was a world champion for a long time uh, yeah, I've been blessed to, to meet a lot of interesting people. And then Willie Moscone, which he was the next great player after Willie Hoppy. Uh, those, those guys all set world right. They were so much better because they played the diamond system. Do you know what the diamond system is, kiddo? Yes, I do. Okay, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not smart enough to uh, follow it. But, you have um, to have learned it. I've learned it and I forgot it the same day. Yeah, <laughs> but those guys were incredible. Of course, they played a lot of... Uh, one pocket, two pocket, four pocket. They played a lot of carom. There's two time. pocket and four pocket. Oh yeah, I didn't know that. One of the nine tables I put in the in the museum in for Brunswick is a five by ten four pocket. There are no side pockets. And if, think about this: five by ten, a lot bigger table. So Earl Strickland wasn't kidding when he said he wanted to play him on a four pocket table. I didn't know. I thought Earl Strickland made that up. That was his no, invention. No. The problem of it is now, and, and, and I'm not picking on the younger generation, but a lot of those games aren't even in the rule books anymore. So it's it's something that, you know, I say, like snooker, most people, but this 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 kid, he's in his 50s, the player was here last week, I mean, he, didn't, he said, I've never even seen a snooker table. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And they're still, and that's why he wow. wanted to go in the pool hall. We played on a 5x10 snooker table. And then I said, Big. have you ever played golf? He said, yeah. what's golf? Yeah. I said, that was what my grandfather was a hustler at. My dad was a hustler at eight ball. My dad was still playing 
up until about two weeks before I put him in the hospital for the his, last time. He was he was uh, a real master at at three rail billiards. Though. Yeah, I have that his, was his. I that have was his, his big game. I think yeah, I have his carom table in my warehouse. You'll get to see it. I would like to see. Yeah, because one of the agreement was when Ralph Starrett bought the pool hall from my dad. Uh, Ralph said, "Well, I'd like you to leave, you know, three or four of the old antiques because they're built so much better than these coin ops. Of yeah. course, coin ops are three and a half by sevens now. Some of them are three by six, and there's too many good players. So you get them on a big table, and they aren't as good. <laughs> At one time, there was only two carom tables in the state of Kansas, and I, I'm assuming they're both. Well, I took down. Yeah, I'm assuming they're both. And there was uh, Russell, Kansas, Pooh Hall had a." Five by ten and a six by twelve snooker. Of course, that's European Canadian snooker. I took an eight foot crutch to play on it, and Dad had a couple of those. But I've traded those a long time ago because nobody wanted. So, I have one question on snooker tables. They seem like they dominated the Kansas area as far as where did what happened to snooker and where did the tables go. A lot of them were destroyed. I mean, they are, you, nobody bought them and put them in their home because of space. That takes a 15 by 20 foot unobstructed area. And like I say, it takes an eight foot crutch. Okay. You know, you're playing with a crutch 25, 30% of the game. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't reach yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and people don't realize snooker table, well, snooker table was either, a table's twice as long as it is wide, period. Okay? Even the three by sixes, even some, I'll show you some of the, uh, historical tables I still have in my collection. Uh, I have an 18 by 36 in my basement in my office. That's the smallest table Brunswick ever made. And then two of the first two tables in Brunswick's uh, historical room uh, that I go to Monday that we just completed after eight years, that has a three and a half by seven and a three and a half by seven home table. One has metal legs and one folds into a Davenport. I'll show you pictures of that stuff. You get a kick out of that. Uh, but Actually, European is, is where snooker came from, and they were 5x10s or 6x12s. Most of them were 6x12. When they came to Canada, then they were 6x12, but they also started playing on 5x10s. But then the 5x10s came down into the States. In Northern States had a lot of 5x10s. And snooker people don't realize the table's bigger, the balls are 2 and an 8, a pool ball is 2 and a fourth, and the pockets are 3 fourths inch smaller on a snooker table. So you're playing on smaller balls, smaller pockets, bigger table. It's a harder game to play, and, and people just didn't want to play it. In 1945, Brunswick was 100 years old. Right? John Brunswick started in 1845 in Cincinnati. Okay? Of course, he made Bagatelli and Jenny Lynn pigeonhole tables, not pool tables. Eventually, they did pool tables. And... Uh, in 1945, for Brunswick's 100th anniversary, they said two of their engineers were given the task in Muskegon, Michigan, where their plant was then, the biggest plant, said, we want a centennial table and an anniversary table. We want two tables to commemorate that first 100 years. Because Brunswick, for over 100 years, controlled 75% of the marketplace. I mean, and that was worldwide. People don't realize how big they were. They had five factories in this country, in our country alone, before 1900. One in Canada, one in Mexico, then they had one in Paris, France, Buenos Aires. I mean, they just, 50% of their revenue, the last I knew, is out of the country. Is, you know, and they say eventually that will grow even more. But anyway, so they uh, came up with a table that hitchhiked on the first table, which has an island or a pedestal leg. And so this is, this isn't the leg, but this is the base of uh, an anniversary in the centennial, and I'll show you pictures of both. Brunswick, they, they, they patented their tables, and they patented three ways. One was a design patent, which is the cosmetic look. Mm -hmm. All right, the next would be the construction methods. That's why if you look on the, uh, I'm gonna get you a rebel. That's why if you look on the end of a, uh, of a table, on an old table, if it's never been messed with or stripped, It'll have a sticker, it'll say patented, and there'll be anywhere from six to 12 dates. Those are construction methods, just like this. The way it's pinned and down together. So they patented the construction methods. They even patented the hardware. 
<laughs> so you couldn't go to a hardware store yeah. and buy replacement bolts. Yes. <laughs> and so nobody could copy their pads. Now true, the pads are good for 7, 11, and 14 years and could be renewed. But by the time you get 10 years past the original pad, they were on to a whole new series of tables. So this is a rail bolt. How am I going to explain this? I even have a rail out here. Well, like what you guys will play on a day is called a flat rail. All right, that means that the rail and the wood liner that the rubber's attached to are one piece. Mm -hmm. And there's a bolt that comes up from the bottom through the slate and bolts into a metal plate in the, on the bottom side of that rail. That's called a flat rail. And that's what all these tables were. So for everything from 1940 on is a flat rail. We'll, we'll look at that when okay. we get in the shop. Okay. But a T-rail is literally, this rail bolt goes through the side of the rail into the slate, and there's a barrel nut that's been leaded in from the back side. So that is what holds the table together. And some of the old tables will have four rail bolts per rail, where everything today is either two or three. It's got a much better tight, much tighter fit. So how do you get that rail bolt in? And this is called a fork wrench. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can, that's why my wife says I put things together nobody can take apart because you crank those things down. And so you're cranking, you know, an inch and a half, two inch plate piece of wood against that slate. And it is tight. Mm -hmm. You stop me. This is not what you want. I mean, you get me on rabbit trails and you, you guys will be here. Will be here. Let's see how far that rabbit trail goes. <laughs> so all the cabinet bolts are like this. So they made an elbow wrench that's tapered. And that yeah, socket's yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's why it cracks me up when they send these 20 and 30 year olds, and I got nothing against the younger generation, send them out with a set of, cro a set of crescent wrenches and a pair of pliers <laughs> and vice grips to take a table, and they call it and say, we can't get this thing apart. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And well, I, when again the warehouse, I'll show you some tables, there's a cutout, and that's why this is made this way. You stick this in that cutout because this bolts recessed into this piece of wood on the sides and the ends. Fascinating, but that's why they control the mark. I mean, they they designed patents, they copied the, the cosmetic look, they patented the hardware, they patented the construction methods, and people say, well, what do you mean they patented the hardware? Because you'll find this kind of bolt over the, the last 170 years being used on other things, and you can say this is 14 and a half or 15 and a half threads per inch, but they tapered these threads at a steeper angle. I can see that. So you can't go get a, a bolt from a hardware store, even back then, and run it through their barrel nuts or the nuts that they used to put this stuff together. And where was our the hardware right? machined at? Brunswick. Early on, different manufacturing? Yeah, company. early on, uh, Groton Hubble out of New York, and there was another company, and I've lost track of that. It was a hardware company that made a lot of the hardware for them, but they made them to their specifications. Eventually, Brunswick got so big that you know, Hyatt used to make all their balls, and then they started making their own, and uh, they started having their own foundries, making their own hardware, they're making their own tools, so, and their own cues. I've got pictures of, I can't remember, I've rotated some of these. Uh, the largest prime factory was in Muskegon, Michigan. Yeah, I'd have to, I'll have to pull a file if that's what you want to look at. But this is in Muskegon, Michigan. Um, and that plant's closed. I had the opportunity to go back about 30 years ago with a, one of their engineers, and they were throwing away stuff. And I said, I, I mean, I loaded my van. I said, if that's going to the dumpster, then I'm going to preserve it. And that's what I never have understood and why I even say to Brunswick, I'm always getting myself in trouble, especially with their lawyers. You know, there are companies that would spend millions of dollars for the kind of advertising and history that you guys have. Because Brunswick literally made both the billiard and the bowling industry in America. I mean, I don't, I'll argue it with anybody. 
and usually the older people won't argue that have done their study and uh, just incredible what they did. I mean, every little poo hall, every little town in America had a poo hall or a- How Americana is the name Brunswick? Oh, it, I mean, you, you said Brunswick, oh yeah, they make bowling alleys and pool tables. Uh, and and, and that there's a point not too long ago, they said Brunswick's name was more associated with pool tables out of the country than it was in. Uh, I mean, they had dealerships, they had factories all over the world. What do you have hanging here? You have, uh, I didn't even see That's this. the history uh, of the crutches. Wow. You got your own museum here. Yeah. And see, here's, well, here's what you get now. That's plastic. Excuse the dust. This is a working shop in yeah. aluminum and pewter. So this is aluminum you go and pewter? all the way back. I've got a couple heads I've loaned to some guys. That's why some of them there don't have heads. But uh, they made them out of ivory. The original ones were out there. Look at the Oh, those are the so beautiful. It's a bamboo stick. I got to get a close up of the heads. Yeah. Ivory. Celluloid, bakelite, ivory. You said moose, moose something? They made them out of buckhorn, all kinds of. Buckhorn? Yeah, all kinds of shapes and stuff. Look how skinny the original cues were, and then they had wood heads on them. So that's the history. That's where it starts from there uh -huh. to the top. Yep. But then originally they used maces. Do you know what a mace is? I've, I've heard of that word. It's like a, kind of like a spear or something like that. Okay. I don't have room to put a full size one. This is what a mace is. This is what was before cues. Before? before like pool cues? Yeah. Maces. That came from England. Wow. Um, this is what they hit the balls with? Yeah. That's now, awesome. Remember, th this is for a, a, a small table. Okay. A full, I'll show you a full size mace in the in the shop in my. Thing. You push the ball. You'll see pictures. You know, two hundred years ago. I mean, they pushed the ball and then they could cup it and put English on it. <laughs> <laughs> he turned sideways to put some English on it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Where's the ball? <laughs> Now that would be a cue ball. Should have got a cue ball. Okay, like this, and then when you wanted to put English on it, you cupped it and you flung it. Oh, wow. Yeah. You flung it like sidearm from the uh -huh. side. Uh-huh. Oh my God. Yeah. That it's is amazing. wild. You see, I wrote a couple articles about it. I need to send you back maybe some copies of the articles. Now, now Joe, these I remember these so well at the idle hour that your dad had because they were like when these. snooker, we would always keep track of, of points this way. Right. Or so, care them, yeah. Sure. And what do you call those? They're just sort of score markers. Score markers. Yeah. See, the oldest sets are these. This is what was in his poo hall. And some would go 100 each way, not just 50. I had one set of 100, but you couldn't string it up here. Uh, and then this is celluloid. That's Bakelite. And then this is metal, and then this is press metal. That's kind of the lineage or the metal, history of press metal. Yeah. And so we would keep score with the snooker tables. Mm -hmm. And I guess for for billiards, for for three rail, would you ever use those? Oh yeah. Or, yes. Yeah. Above each table in his pool hall, and they took them all down. And above each table would be a score counter. Uh, you know, and then for this young man's, I mean, you know, okay, I got 11 points and I'm white. Yeah. You shoot and you got three points. Yeah. Next time I got two. Yeah. And then whatever you went yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. the ones, some of them in dad's poo hall, I, you know, I think you only had one set that went to 100. Most of them were 50. But that's how you kept score. You've seen it. Yeah. Kirk and this company still in existence. So you put glue there, yeah, 
and you put this tip, you found the right size. I mean, they went from 11, millier, 11 millimeter all the way up to 14. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that this isn't the right size. Mm -hmm. And then you glued it, and then you push that down like that. And then you took this like this, and you, he always pounded on the top of it. Right. And that's how you had it. See, this one was patented in 1884. I guess my eyes are reading me. Yeah, 1884. All right, and then now, what, what what do you think that one's for? In the old poo halls and stuff. I'll leave the tip. Here. They did this. This is a Brunswick patent. And that way, in the old poo halls, they fix the cues during the day, and at night. They'd hang them on the wires. They leave it hanging. Uh huh. Because <laughs> the glue had to dry overnight. Okay, this is what I was going to show you. Because we're not going to have time to do all this. Okay. Cues today. This is an old Brunswick. Still got the logo on it. Okay, cues today have a flat bottom and usually a rubber bumper, right? Okay, so if you saw a cue like that, you'd go, boy, I can't put a rubber bumper on there. How come that's like that? Dude, this is a cue from the 30s, 1930s. So it's flat and it would have a little hole in the middle and there'd be a rubber bumper on there, okay? But it's round and it's flat. So. If you saw a cue like this, that's not round, and it's not flat, what would you say? What? Because I've had guys say, well, we just cut it off. I go, you know what you just cut off? Okay, remember we talked about a mace. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm gonna show you the regular head. All right, when they went from maces to cues, some people still preferred to use a mace. So, what I'm saying to you on this end would be a tip. No ferrule. Originally, there were no ferrules. You know what a ferrule is, okay? There was just a tip, all right? So, they might shoot like this, but then if they wanted to mace wise, they wanted to go back to the mace style. See, it's flat, so it won't roll and it's tapered and usually there's a piece of cork or a piece of cloth glued on there and they would shoot that way. Dang. So that was the jump between a mace and a cue. So you'll find cues that have used both ends. And guys have been cutting those off. They're going, oh man, you just <laughs> lost all these value. <laughs> these are two of the funnest two tables I did here in New York. Uh, okay, that's Moradella rosewood species, this background. And that's probably mahogany walnut, and then that's a maple maybe. I can't remember. I'll show you a bigger picture of this. This table was made, These there were six of these made for a firehouse in Upper New York. I can't remember, Unica, Albany, and I bought two of them. There were two left. And this has fire scenes. Look at the two horses. Wow. And that's all inlay. That's all cut out of different species of wood. That's not painted on. Incredible tables. But that's, like I say, that's the marquetry work. Uh, and that's why some of these tables, I mean, they're pieces of art. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them have not survived, and a lot of them have been damaged. You can, they're impossible to repair. Thank um, you. They would hand fit, and so when they hand fit it, and then it went to maybe a assembly and finishing, storage and shipping. Every piece that could be taken off of that table was serialized. Okay, so that and there it is. is serial. Yeah, and, and so this serial number here, I'll, I'll tell you what that's for. Okay. But that's the serial number of the table. The slates would be stamped in with black lettering like a stencil, painted. But then on every piece uh, that could come off of that table, they stamped that serial number. And then if you look here, it says three, four. Yeah. So oh. this, this is the end of the table, yes. which is the foot end. Yeah, okay. 
because every table, and I, I don't even do that anymore because everything is generic. So, so it start going around the table. So back then they used to they say, okay, you you can't just shoot and slot the balls in. So you had to call the pockets. Okay. So everything was standardized. So. So you got the head of the table, and you got the foot, and this usually had the name pipe. And every company did this. So that is a manufacturer that was like free advertising, mm -hmm. right? So this is pocket one, that's pocket two, that's pocket three, that's pocket four, that's mm -hmm. pocket five, and that's mm -hmm. pocket six. So. This rail that goes here, and this rail that goes here, and this rail that goes here, on the end of this rail would be three, and on the end of this rail would be three, five and five, and two and so forth. So you matched everything up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so what I'm saying to you is, that piece of skirting, which is this gingerbread, yeah. on the end between the legs, would go right there. Right, 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 right. You know exactly where it goes in exactly. correlation to the Now, table. this this was probably, you could have turned these around, and they probably would have been okay. But when you start talking about the ends of the rails and the pockets and all that, yeah, you want everything to fit. That's why people will call and say, we put we moved this guy's <laughs> antique table, and now we can't level it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. That, that, well, here's my dad. Yeah. Yeah, he did pretty good. This was their fifth, fiftieth yep. wedding anniversary. My de folks, that's was my mom, but that was, a, and I said, I, I want that. Can't read the year anymore. Eighty four, maybe. But I, uh, I kept that. Wow, good, very good picture. Yes. Yeah. Well, you would remember, kid. This is my brother Greg. Oh, that's Greg. Yeah. Oh, standing okay. in Joe's he workshop was, was like standing in a yeah, time you machine. Quit telling people you're my you had because you are my artifacts and Greg was in David's all sorts class, of different pool-related things she from she over a hundred years ago. Now we headed to his office <laughs> to see even more cool stuff. I think Dad. These are the two oh. sizes of ivory billiard balls. Oh, okay. Here's what you'd have played with at the pool. In fact, this is the last set that he had. Carom oh. set, two whites and a red. Here you go, Manny. On the, on the billiards. Yeah, carom table, two whites and a red. And, and one of the white balls is marked with a spot. Yep. So that, that's yours and that's mine, so we could tell mm -hmm. the balls apart. Right. That's ivory, too. It's just been dyed. I, I got a big discussion. You know, you guys teach you something. I, I learned from an 80-year-old guy. See that? What do you think that is? Because see, even on the one that's not marked, it's still there. And you turn it over, and it's got an opposite. So it goes right through the middle of that. So would they drill a... No. An ivory tusk. They I must have burned something oh, through it. No. no? No. An ivory tusk... I don't care, and I had one, but it's in the museum, whether it's four feet, eight feet, or 10 feet. An ivory tusk is like a human tooth. Oh, it has okay. a blood vessel that goes uh, right through the middle, uh, and it glows, grows in an annual ring like a tree. Uh, so to make sure that that ball is symmetric, that it won't go kablunk, 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 mm -hmm. when they pin it and put it on a lathe and turn it round, they use that blood vessel to pin it to be the center, so it becomes perfect. Wow. So wow. it'll roll perfect. Wow. So, so what, that is the blood vessel that goes through the center part of the tooth. So or what, the ivory tusk. when uh, do you have an approximate year that they went from ivory to... Oh uh, Yeah, is about in the 1870s because Brunswick alone was importing 12,000 tusks annually. That's 6,000 al elephants. And ivory pool balls was the only, I mean, they made ivory buttons, ivory combs, barrettes, all kinds of stuff.
piano keys. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so mm -hmm. it, it yeah. started to get to be critical. So Brunswick offered a ten thousand dollar reward for somebody that came up with a substitute, and Hyatt billiard ball. The Hyatt brothers invented celluloid, which is a forerunner of okay. plastic. And then about what time? Oh, you know, late eighteen seventies. Okay. So they invented and the celluloid specifically to replace the... Well, um, they did clay first, but yeah, yeah, clay, that's a clay ball. So you almost can, people say, oh, I got an ivory ball, and I say, no, number one, look and see if you got that hole, and it doesn't. And then see a, an ivory tusk as it ages, that's the annual ring, and see that doesn't have. That's clay. Now today is everything is a uh, philosophic, it's a, it's a high impact plastic. Like phenolic resin? Yeah, yeah. And really the only billiard ball company of any size is left in the world is Amarath, which is Belgium. And that's probably what you guys are playing on. Playing Aramis, um, we yeah. play uh, Centennials. Yep, yep. Here you want to see what the first one looked like? Wow. Well, it's light. It's made out of wood. Wow. Huh. Well, they did a good job of getting around. Yeah, I've <laughs> lost all the coin. That's the only one I've ever been able to find because they threw them all away. Wow, well, here you go, Joe. Tell me what these are. <laughs> Give me this one. You guys, you're pool players, all right? Oh, See, there's, they're marked differently. Okay. Okay, now, why would you do that? That's a cue ball. That's a cue ball. I'll give you a hint. That's a cue ball. There's a diamond and a star. A star. Does this have a diamond too? Yeah, it's a smaller diamond. It's a, snooker, it, snooker it's a oh, there it's we go. Tiny, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. So one's a snooker cue ball. I man, I don't know. I must sit down, you guys. Okay. Think about this. Okay. These are all clay. In the old pool halls, they played pool. You got 15 number balls and one cue ball. Okay. They're made out of clay. So originally they were all, let's say, fired at the same temperature. So they all have the same hardness. All right? So if you're playing six to eight hours a day, you're going to wear out a set of a ball, a whole set of balls in a hurry. So these are called mud balls mm -hmm. or break balls. And they always distinguished, they had some marking that you could tell that they're different. So what you would do is you would break with these and then after you broke you picked up the original cue ball or this cue ball and put the original down and it was the same as the rest of the balls. That way you wore out the cue ball uh, not the whole set. I see. So uh, they could replace the cue ball Yeah every yeah. six months instead of the whole set so it saved a lot of money so they always did they had some kind of distinguished marking i mean you couldn't tell by looking at them that they're fired at a lesser temperature and they're softer material and that's why they have a lot of flat marks on them so that's a, a mud ball and these are break balls <laughs> that makes sense yes yes smart yes yes it is yeah that is that's Oh, wow. The small racks are for little tables. Here, here's the smallest table Brunswick ever made. There you go, Brunswick bought Colander. <laughs> they made that in the early teens. <laughs> there's the balls that go with it. I didn't get the whole set. So, so people would actually have uh, matches on that small table. Oh, that was for the home markets. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. wouldn't have tournaments. That yeah, was, that was no. a novelty. Yeah. Oh, I, I see. Sold for seven dollars yeah. and fifty cents. <laughs> they didn't have cloth on so it. it. Yeah. I had two of them. One of them's in the museum. <laughs> it's just a fold-up thing, so the kids could play. See, Brunswick realized that, you know. Hey, we've already saturated 
the saloons, the bars, the billiard parlors. Mm -hmm. You know, every, all those every little town's got a bar with our tables in them. So now what? Now are we, we gonna need do? to get the kids involved. The kids and the family, because you know, kids Smart. and wives wouldn't go in those places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. said, hey, it's going to be the home market. So Brunswick's got a whole set of posters starting in about the late 1870s, early 1880s, which started promoting family entertainment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what changed that industry. Yeah. So think about it. A pool table never home, the potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Oh. Because, you know... That's what the first rubber looked like. Wow. Wow. Now, you guys, I mean, I said, here's Willie Hoppy. He had a line of rubber. Well, it's Brunswick. Uh, but this is what the rubber would be the profile of what you okay. have on your tables a day. But that's... So these that's, would be the rubber bumpers. Yeah. yeah. This is this is an end. This yeah. is a pocket. But look, look at how it was. You talk about crude. Think about what kind of bounces you would get off of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, Brunswick made tires. Um, they made all kinds of stuff. I had a Brunswick tire uh -huh. sign and actually Brunswick tire and some of this other stuff that went. Brunswick was into radios. This is stuff I restored and put in the museum. Uh, first Brunswick phonograph. This is a scoring stand. Brunswick bought Colin. Brunswick also, do you know that Brunswick is responsible for manufacturing and marketing the surfer, which became the first snowboards? Didn't I know? <laughs> so these are in, these are were here and then I we moved them to the museum, so there's mm -hmm. in the museum. You guys are like I am. We're not old enough. Donald Desky, there's even a museum in New York. He was kind of the Frank Lloyd Wright of the housing industry that was about 100 years, 50 to 100 years ahead of his time. Don Densky did furniture. Well, Brunswick hired him in the late 30s to say, hey, we want you to modernize our tables. This is the book written about him, and there it is. He is the one that actually patented and invented the pedestal legs, the first pool table. Huh. And that's yeah. this table. That's why I chose it. Oh. That's a designer table. He also was hired to modernize the, uh, that talks about the Brunswick, to modernize the bowling alleys. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. Oh, okay. So it's the same kind of yeah, um, curves and all yeah, that. He yeah. loved lines. Yeah. This is all a book written about all the furniture he did. But wow. they hired him. And so when Brunswick got to the, uh, got to the, uh, 1940s and realized, early 94 realized we're going to be 100 years old. So they came up with the word centennial and anniversary, and those two tables were to commemorate Brunswick's first 100 years in business. When those two engineers I told you about designed, here's remember this cabinet base? Yes, kind of yes. Leg? That's a centennial. Okay. That's the last table. The original patent. If you look at the original patent, you will see, here's the two engineers for Brunswick that did it. You will see that they reference Donald Desky. They had mm. to because they were hitchhiking on, on the yeah. pedestal legs. Yes, yes, yes. So. so that's why that's important. What I've done is gone back and actually researched. There's the patent. That's incredible research that you've done. And this is John Brunswick's home in Cincinnati. Still there. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, well, he was a very, very wealthy, influential so man. They, uh, what oh, music, you love this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want to play some music? Yeah. I mean, he was, John Brunswick was, was a self made man. I mean, he was incredible. So, in 1859, I don't know who James Harrison is, but in 1859, James Harrison composed the Brunswick Polka Mazurka and dedicated it to J.M. Brunswick. <laughs> the original music sheet is in the museum. I've tracked it down, I remember where I got it. But that's the music. Oh come on, can he play it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, look at it. It's it's all it's all it's all very very playable, you know, the melody line. Where can we find uh, I've had I've this, had is this online or anything? Yeah, no. I've had uh, Brunswick 
Polka Mazurka Zirka. by James Harrison. 1859. Uh, 1859. I will remember that. I'll, well, I'll, I can make I'll you a copy. That. Yeah, I'll that, copy. I love to have a copy. Um, <laughs> I've had our church pianists play it. Yeah. I've had our church organist play it. Yeah, and it's, it's very playable. Yeah. But yeah. It, it it's kind good. of neat sound. Yeah. If you can give yeah. me a copy, I'll get people to play it. We'll record it and right. we'll, put it on, we'll put it on the documentary. All right. yeah. you, you remember. We'll, we'll take it great. back out. But That's this, great. The yeah. original sheet's in the yeah. Out of all the cool things that Brunswick accomplished, I think the coolest was having a piece of music dedicated to your work. All the people you helped and all the people you influenced. It had to be an amazing feeling to know somebody cared about you that much. Now we headed to the Idle Hour, Joe's father's old pool hall. So we're here at the Idle Hour in Kansas. We're at we're here at the Idle Hour in Kansas. Yep, place in Kansas. And Joe, you said your father, and your grandfather probably played on this table here. Oh no, they always or, dad owned this place. Yeah. When he got back from World War II, he bought it and then he ran it until he sold it to the present owner. But it had uh, all all eleven tables ran too. But he played on this specific table here. Yeah, my grandfather played a lot of snooker and golf. My dad played three cushion tables. Carol. That you said he even had a heart attack in this area. My, my grandfather was playing one afternoon, had a heart attack, and I took him to the hospital, and he died in the hospital. So he was playing a game of golf on this table where the day he died. And we just got finished playing a game of golf, so. Right, right. How does my heart? Yeah, and you won. <laughs> <laughs> this was it, this was the idle hour. So this was a pool hall Kenny had spoken to me about. The same pool hall that all these farmers must have been playing cards in and games of snooker back then when Kenny was just 13. Now we were headed to go check out Joe Newell's storage unit. There he would show us some really cool antique tables. Even up, it's short, it's short. There's no name, no nothing. Oh, yeah. We put it in Camp David in the White House. This is its sister. This is the match. That's an original, restored. You can't tell them apart. I bought them out of the same place. And this belong. I sold this. Oh. See, that was delivered in 95. So this would have been delivered in 96. A guy in Florida bought it from me and then they're building a new house. He said, would you come and get it and restore it? So I went and drove down to Florida a month ago. And they got some scratches, but it's, it's not that bad. But this is, uh, here's where that boat goes, remember? Oh, it's still in here. Yeah, I thought I didn't take the legs off when I went and got it. There's where that elbow wrench goes. Mm -hmm. There's that head. Mm -hmm. uh, but Brunswick, this is the key rack that I did for the guy. Well, I, I had an original key rack that went with one of the tables. It's a solid mahogany. There's no veneer. It's all carbon. These are the slates. Oh, that's a, that's a good thing. Remember I told you that. Of course, yeah, I remember I re-stenciled this. But look here. All right, so this is a four-piece slate. All right. See these two drill marks? Yes. One and one. Two, 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 three, three. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, you can yeah. you can barely see the one on the wood, but see that always that's where you stretch the cloth and you tack this. So that those numbers get always chewed up. And then this serial number over there, that would be on here too, but you can see a six. Here's a two. Mm -hmm. But then I re-stenciled this just so if somebody else, somebody has to take it apart, they'll they'll really be able to tell. And then you can see, look at the craftsmanship and what they make today. This goes with a table called a Brilliant Novelty. Uh, it's been stripped and sanded, rough sanded, so it'll get restored someday. Yeah, just incredible workmanship. Yeah. And here, you know what, I'll give you guys some posters. You, you drove, didn't you? Yeah. That Mark Flew, the guy who was here a week ago, and he said, I can't carry those on the airplane. He said, I want 12 of them. I said, you can have them, because I got 2,000 of them. Oh. But here, here's the thing that's important. 
Okay. In 1995, I'm going to go up there and point it. In 1995, Brunswick was 150 years old. And so we did a six month display at the, I told you that, Chicago Cultural Center, yeah. which is an old public library. Yeah. We set up a jewel, which was an oak one. It was just a different yeah. one than these. And then they put a lot of their boats and the bowling pin guys did their thing. I set up a table. And then that, because billiards started, that first room as you walk through it, and they said, Joe, we want you to pick up one of your original posters and we're going to reproduce it. And everybody that goes through gets one. And we're going to give it to our dealers. Well, they were supposed to print like 4,000. They printed 10. And my contract said that they had to give me back the original artwork, the stencils, all the negatives, and whatever was left over. And I show up to get my negative. They said, what are you going to do about these two pallets of posters? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Their contract, they're yours. I said, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> and so that was, now there's a couple guys that bought them and they're enlarging them and shrinking them on eBay for 10 bucks, 75 bucks. So I sold it. So now it's not a big deal. Yeah. I, I sold them for 25 bucks a piece. Yeah. For, I don't oh. remember how many thousand I sold. Oh. Oh, but shit. here's what's important. Remember we talked about, all right, this is Brunswick and Balk. Yeah. So that's before 1884. So that's right. 1874 to 1884. Right. That was a time period that Brunswick said, we've saturated all the saloons, all the bars. How are we going to grow our business? And they said, we need to get the families involved. Yeah, so look what's in here. So the women. women and children. Yeah. And she, the child yeah. shooting behind the back. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And what's yeah. even more, this is John Brunswick when he's 56 yeah. years old. <laughs> and these are his executives of the company. Yeah. So that is, a, that that's why is I chose that one. I chose an historical yeah. poster. Yeah. And look what the women are playing. Karen, no pockets. Wow. And that's one of Brunswick's more recognizable table called a monarch because these are cast why, lions. Why is that a black ball? It looks like a black ball. That's red. That's red. Okay. Remember there's two white and a red. Okay. For Karen. And look at this fancy Q cabinet. Yeah. So that, cool. that was, so anyway, so come with me. And yeah. you guys, you can, you can, well, you can take a thousand if you want. Remember, look at these two stacks I got, I'll give them to you. Okay, this remember I talked about Irving K was one of the first guys that made a fancy coin op? Right. Here it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's a coin op, it's still for mica, but look at the fancy, and look at the corners, and those are the legs. So, oh, so this is for mica. No, no, that's metal, that's, that's oh, metal. Oh, this is metal. That's original finish, he kind of gold leafed it. And these are the paws that go underneath that line. These here. That's gorgeous. Isn't it? It's beautiful. These, these are pretty much a hot collector's item. So what would the con be? The coin operate be a quarter? When they had quarter tables? Yeah, I think this probably was, it could even be like, somebody took out the coin slots. Oh, so they did? Tell you okay. I can't tell you. And, but Guy showed up with one of these. And how tickets. many of these do you think were made? I don't do know. Have, really no. don't know. Once in a while you'll see one on eBay or Craigslist. Yeah. Uh, Dad had, I think we bought a place that had three or four, and this was huh. the one we had left, and so huh. I took it. Very. So that's an Irving K. That's one of the first coin ops. More fish mm -hmm. what you call it. But these are tables back, inlaid tables that need work. But these are inlaid tables that go back to the 1870s and 1880s. This is a Jefferson. This is Mother of Pearl Squares, and these are celluloid. That's an aviator. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, no. Yeah, uh, uh, some tables were equipped with undergrounds, which had ball returns. Mm -hmm. Some of them are wooden troughs, and some of them are corrugated cardboard, like that, that up in that ceiling. This is hardware and stuff. And that's a brilliant novelty, which is one of the more desirable tables. See all the inlay, minus mm -hmm. the dust. Mm -hmm. And then, we'll go over here. Underneath this pile, remember I said the Elizabethan? Remember that picture I pulled out and said I have an Elizabethan and a prototype? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a special order. This is that table. It's already been restored. So it, you're just I'm either going to hang on to it or wait no, for I, a buyer? I'm, I'm going to sell it. Yeah. But that's an Elizabethan. And then that prototype or one of a kind. What's oh, the size? inlays are gorgeous. What's the yeah. size on the Elizabethan? 
These are all four and a half by nines. Okay. The thing that make this unique, and this is why I'm going to bore you with it, talk about it. All right. Back then, they were still playing carom. A lot of the very wealthy that ordered these kind of tables, they wanted a pool table and a table that they could play carom on. Right, right. So what Brunswick invented was... Okay, I was going to ask it. Eureka convertible rails. Oh, okay. I thought you might be able to put something inside the pockets, but you can't. Nope. It's not that simple. So this is this, a box that held yeah. the set of carom rails. Okay. So there's four of these. Yeah, those this, this have is, been used. No, well, this is new cloth. Oh, and this you has put been that on. And this yeah. has been restored. So this is the head rail. Yeah. So this is one, this is two, and then you got two long rails down the side, because remember there's no pockets. Yeah, yeah. So how much work have you done on this table to get oh, it to this? There's probably you, four or five hundred hours. On this one. Four or five hundred hours on this table? Oh yeah. I've got some tables that are a thousand hours. You're doing it all by hand. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, here's a rail assembly. Okay. Okay, at one time the rail bolt goes through there and is goes into that rail bolt. Mm -hmm. That lead, let it in rail let it in barrel bolt. Okay. Okay, and then some of the rail some of the rails when you go back here, they are finished. Okay. So you put the rail bolt through there and you put a little brass cap and cover up that bolt that I showed that it had those two little holes. Okay. All right. Then they started doing rail blinds. The rail stayed the same, but they didn't have exposed rail bolts, so they made rail blinds. So that ah, covers up those the rail ornament bolts. piece to cover up the bolts. Uh-huh. This is later. Okay, so what they did was, when somebody says, well, I want an extra set of carom rails right. that I can play, well, you'd have to take all this apart. You might spend an hour taking right. everything right. apart. Right. So what they devised was a system, this part stays there. Okay, and this just goes over it? Yeah, and what happens is, there is, there were two conventions. One was three little brass thumbs that you unscrewed that yeah. went all the way through here. This is going to be gone. The screwed into this and the other kind which is this kind was the best it had a metal lever that you pulled towards you and that had metal linkage that hooked all that together okay. and it turned that screw like this. so there would be a linkage on, uh -huh. on 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 this part on that part so it's already over there yeah it's and wrapped then, up yeah and so all you do is you just come over here and you grab it go like and that then, this and pop rail pops off and, and you put this on you don't even have to take the pockets off it takes okay. about 15 minutes that's what the wealthy did. If you go to oh, the Vanderbirds, the, the, mm -hmm. we could go on and on. Yeah. Roosevelt's home, uh, they all had Eureka convertible rails so they could play either game. And what year did they establish this about? Well, this, this patent is 1894 or 97, I don't okay. remember which. But, but this is solid rosewood, Yeah. mother of pearl, and then this is the inlaid pinstripe which matches what's on that side of that cabinet. This huh. rail goes to this one. Very, very interesting. Think, yeah. But everything is serialized and numbered. You can't mess up. But this is the extra set of rails that would be underneath uh -huh. the table. And that's so you could Did, play. How two. many of you, do you have any idea of about how many of these? They made they, a lot because all the wealthy had billiard rooms okay. and they all had Eureka convertible rails. Uh, then the, uh, the table we talked about, the one of a kind, actually the prototype, that's the one underneath there. This one over here. This isn't the Henry Ford table that you're no, working on. No, that's that one there. Okay. But this is the way well, I showed you the picture so it makes more sense to you. See, so come over here. Remember that big claw? You know that carving that was on the end of that table? Yes. There it is. And there's the drawers. Here's the rail assembly. Oh, man. Yeah. It's got what we call a library shelf. These are the two ends. The one, one, one end is one piece and the foot end is the other. And then all this sets on this, 
And then that sits on these big round legs that should be in the middle here. I haven't restored this. I've had could, this for 20 years. I mean, could you even, if you had something like this, have to transport it in that, that van? I, I, I wouldn't got it. That's, everything and, in here has been transported and, in the van. And how, what's the total weight on it? Uh, this will probably be 23, 2400 pounds. So you couldn't do this plus the slate okay. at the same time? Yeah, well and that's the total the, weight. Total weight 20. See there's the big Ooh. turnings that are the legs that actually touch the floor. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But, uh, what, what, what is the deal? So I still got a one of a kind, and I still got one special order. I, I'm not buying tables anymore. It just, it's so like, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, you won't be able to do it forever, and you probably have. Yeah, there's not going to be a fourth generation. So is that it? That's an ivory ball there. No, it isn't. No, it's a newer. That's an Armat. Cause see, it's got the Brunswick oh, okay. circle. Okay. Yeah, the ivory ball has got to have that vein and it's mm -hmm. dark, and you'll see it start to. Uh, and ivory form ivory can't will turn the yellow. I mean, it, if, if the real trick, I had an older guy, a jewelry store guy, say, I took him some pieces. I said, I can't tell from looking like they made crutch heads, they made ferrules mm -hmm. on the tips out of ivory. And I said, I can't tell the difference. He said, he said well, he said, I'll give you the easiest way, but he said, you know, you're going to make some marks. And he took a little, like an exacto knife, and he scraped. And he said, he scraped it. And he said, now, and he pushed it up into my nose. He said, what does that smell like? I said, man, it sounds like the last time I went to the dentist and he drilled a hole in my tooth. He said, exactly. And then he took a piece of, he said, this looks like ivory too, doesn't it? And I said, yeah, I did the same thing. And I said, that smells like a piece of plastic. He said, there's your answer. Anything that is man-made is going to smell like plastic, whether you take yeah. sandpaper and rub it or scrape it. The, yeah. the stripping, the little carving. He said a mother, uh, mother pearl. Mother pearl has a different smell too. But ivory, he said, will smell like a burnt tooth. It's not man-made. It's nature-made. Mm -hmm. So that was my, that was my schooling on. If I can't really tell the difference, yeah. Yeah. there's my dad's chateau. Okay. And this is, and the reason he picked this table to put in there and play on all those years, that's the only table Brunswick made where they turned the legs 45 degrees. See the leg? It's not square. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Base. So that that was in the idler? That, that was the play? table that you played that was, on. If you played that was the billiard table. Yeah. That was in there for as long as I was alive. Wow, beautiful. It's the only table they made where they kind of changed that angle of the yeah, foot there. The, the legs don't set square. It's called a chateau. They patented it in 1912. If I remember, it was May. Huh. That's quarter sod oak. They also made it out of mahogany. But this is this is mother of pearl, and all this is celluloid pinstriping, which is a forerunner of plastic. That's a non puriel That's all inlaid. But you know, you get them like this. Well, they're stripped. I stripped just this part to show a guy. See, that's unstripped. That's stripped. Wow, the old, wood really comes out oh, yeah. when you well, strip you it. Got, you know, the grain you years see. of old shellac and varnishes that turn black. Yeah, if you strip this, this would be just like that. It'd be gorgeous. And that's that and that's, a, that's a burl walnut, I think. I that's beautiful what, wood right there. Yeah, incredible what they used. Don't leave here without a pile of posters, you guys. Okay. Yeah. No, oh, we can take all of them now that Kenny em em emptied his uh, <laughs> instruments. <laughs> I got, I, you know. It's cold here. This is great. We can need this blanket. Um, we, I did some. The museum, you didn't, you didn't see all the pictures of the key racks in the wall, but we did match the key racks and ball racks for those nine tables in the museum, and we ran out of space. So I brought back. <laughs> the restored ball racks because they were matching ball racks to all those tables and key racks. So I'll sell them. Great. Yeah. That's beautiful. Because they just didn't have room. And I said, that's that's right. I'll take them back and sell them. So I got two more. Right. I have four that I came back with. Yeah. Well. That's, that's and they're beautiful. Everything here is beautiful. It's just the wood. It's a wood. It's timeless. Yeah. So, but I'm reworking these slates 
a guy took all the slate boards out, slate screws out. There's an inch and a half screw that screws this slate to this board. That's the framing board. You never take them off. This screw goes all the way through the slate, through the wood into the cabinet. That's what keeps the slate tight. Okay. Not movable. So somebody took all of them out. They just went and took all the screws out. So the boards fell off. So I, that's what I did. I'm putting the screws back in and I'm putting Bondo in it so they can't dig it out. I see. And so any of, any of the imperfection in the state, the slate like you put. Yep. Bondo works Bondo. the best. Oh, okay. It's and hard it to dig out. Completely, yeah. And I will, I, completely I had to right. mess up my stencil, so I'll re stencil that. And this one, uh, these two, I have to re stencil. But if you go over here, 30624, mm -hmm. every piece that I can take off of this table, if you know where to look. Yeah. 30624. Yeah. That matches up with two, and this matches up with one. You put it together the way they built it. You, yeah. This is the cross piece that goes this way. Well, this is this has been a wonderful tour, tour, Joe. And uh, well, thank you for your anything I should for your time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you bought well, lunch, and we got mine, the, mine we got to play snooker and golf, and I got beat. Of course, that doesn't. Well, that no, has not a chance to beat me. Well, <laughs> I don't this know what else great. is in here we really can talk about, guys. Um, Did you have anything you want to say to the documentary or to the no, pool people? Hey, or it's fun. I don't get to drag a couple guys around with me to all these places, and you didn't interrupt me talking. You didn't even ask that many questions. No, there was no questions. We, I think I had some questions written down, but it was like four or five, and well, it was like, uh, what's let's your favorite color? What was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite wood? Oh. Well, this definitely, you know, we've been really blessed and fortunate to be able to do this. And uh, I'll do this till I'm 80 or longer if I can. And Brunswick can't find anybody under 50 that will do it or can do it, I guess. So I'll, I'll do it as long as I can. It's, this is a love. Maybe Brunswick ought to open up a school and you ought to be the teacher. We and did. Then... We did. We, we taught two of their people and one got fired and one quit. They said, we'll just stick with you. Joe Newell was surely an incredibly interesting man. He went on for hours and hours without even having to catch his breath. He had so much information and so much history and knowledge. What he had were memories. Memories of Brunswick, memories of the farm, memories of his family, and memories of Brunswick Billiards. Most of all, I think his father really just wanted him to pass on this information to other Tom generations. Held pants over here. So I was really glad I got in to Kansas. go in, record, and document all of what Mr. Newell had to say. Before we left, that, uh, on we took CL's advice, Kenny's brother, who recommended we stop by the local town museum and check out some of the artifacts. What we saw there it was also really incredible. He came here three or four times, and I was going to become a sort of self-titled historian of Green, Kansas. Ah. And she came in because that gentleman is from Green, and she said, "Well, um, one of the ladies she was with asked me." Sorry, hang on. Okay. Oh yeah. And Harry Bumstead, I knew Harry. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, and, you know, had you heard that name before? Yeah, I've heard the name before. And he ran, uh, he had a little uh, little shop of, of, what I remember, it's candy and, and a wholesale, uh, you know, different items like that, like candy and different um, eating items. I'm sure there was a lot more, but I remember especially from the city band because I, I'm uh, I was and 
Seal and I knew him from, and everybody who was in the city band years ago knew Harry because he played sax. And he was one of the, oh, I guess at that time he was younger than I was. Yes. He seemed like an old guy. So, <laughs> I look terrible today, so bear with me. But you'll notice that the brand is Brunswick on here. And most people nowadays think of Brunswick as bowling alleys yes. and pool halls, right? Yes. Pool tables. It turns out that we have in this town the what's considered the worldwide historian for Brunswick. It, would you his, happen to know that? What is his name? <laughs> I, was, I was waiting to see if he jumped all over me or not. Anyway, his dad's name was Loyal Newell, also known as Pappy, and his son is Joe. Joe's 71 years old, so I called him and I said, is this the Brunswick we know today? Yep. And he said, oh yeah. He said they used to sell radios and uh, of all the things, car tires. Things Toilet like, seats? Well, I don't know about that. Let's not get too carried away. <laughs> no, he, he's right on. We spent about six hours, the last six hours with Joe. We Did just you? came from Joe. Oh. We just finished recording <laughs> everything, so with that's you. what we're doing. Well, <laughs> that's the reason we came. But because okay. I, you know, uh, C.L. Snodgrass is my brother, and I, you know, C.L., uh, <laughs> we're staying with C.L., but, but uh, Manny is a, is a pool. I'm a pool player from Austin, so right. everybody in Austin, we're going to see and the Brunswick. You know, the Brunswick, street, where so Brunswick nice. came from, like its origins and stuff, and cool. all the other cool stuff. You know about the Brunswick, Brunswick Museum makes. up in Wisconsin, right? Yeah, he, he was telling us yeah. about it. Uh, we haven't been there. Well, I'll show you some things that actually came from that museum in, in just a minute, if that's okay. I'd, this yeah. is one of the things I like to brag about. This is made in 1899. So, did you ever hear about a store called the Candy Kitchen? No. Well, this came from there. You know where the idle hour is? Yeah, oh yeah, I spent many hours. Yeah. But before that was there, the candy yeah. kitchen was there. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> this is Regina Music Box. Like I said, it's made in 1899. Uh, we verified it on the serial number and all that because luckily they have a good trail down through history. Uh, we have a few other things that came from the candy kitchen. Have a couple of stories that are really you know, for a small town, you don't get very good stories. They're okay stories. So, one of the stories from the Candy Kitchen was in the local newspaper. It said, today, the owners of the Candy Kitchen were contacted by a national ice cream company. They wanted to make a deal with the owners because they couldn't get their chocolate to stick to their ice cream bars. That's the end of the story. We don't know if, if the deal was ever made or not. But if you think about it nowadays, you know, it's nothing to get chocolate on nice. Okay, watch the carriage. It moves forward one, and then it automatically picks up the next one. So if I wound this hard enough, which I will not do since it's so old, yeah, it'll yeah. actually go forward and backward, play all 10, <clears throat> go the other way, play the other 10, and do it all day long. But like I tell kids, I won't wind it that far because I don't want to have to listen to it all day. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Man, that's great. So, and so and if you want a close up, I don't know if you want to see the back side of it. These uh, little. All that braille. All these little things here are what cause it to um, make the tone. Uh, huh. It same principle as uh, what uh, the piano, the player piano. Yeah. And I play the player piano, but the funny thing about it is every November it stops working and usually starts working right about now. It's on the edge right now that's cool do you have any other products that were uh, made by Brunswick yes this came from Joe Wow. Newell. he brought here let me get out so you got a little more light but he brought that in the other day with two others uh, this one is what you would call a bedroom you know it'll fit on a dresser yeah the one that you already saw is you know the kind you see in a parlor or a front room but he also brought us what's called a portable one. It had a canvas uh, bag that went around with nice zippers and everything, wonderful shape, almost as nice as this one. Now here's the fun one though. They also had external speakers. 
Now we're talking 1920s, I believe. I'd have to check with Joe on that, but whoever thinks about having external speakers in the 1920s? Yeah. Well, you know what, let your parents hear what kind of music you're playing <laughs> so they can come after you. Yeah, exactly. That's actually, that's all I have for Brunswick, except for upstairs. I have part of the bowling lane before it got uh, destroyed this year. Uh, don't, that's a bad way to say it. All right, cool. Demolished we'll, this year. We'll, uh, we'll check it out. Okay. Well. You don't have to. I'm just saying. Yeah, How do we? Here, right here. Okay. I'm I'm interested in doing the upstairs displays. Yep. Is there anything upstairs? Yeah. Okay. I'll take you up in a minute. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. For too long. So this is the last Brunswick thing we have. The last. Um, come on, Dane's right here. Pen setters was the. Yep. Last bowling alley in Clay Center. Yeah. It was demolished early this year. That's what was here. Yeah, it was early this year yeah. in preparation for Dollar General moving out there. And if you looked out there this week, you see that it's real close to being open now. So I'm, I'm sorry that there's no more bowling, although I was never a bowler. So you but. can see Brunswick here. You can see the inside of a bowling ball, which most people haven't seen. Yeah. And then you can How did you, oh, so they. How did y'all get that bowling ball open? I somebody chop, karate chopped that open? Great. What's that? I'm so, sorry. Did somebody karate chop that open? No, they used a big bandsaw on it. <laughs> if you have a bandsaw that cut metal, it'll cut a bowling ball. Brunswick laser. Dang, it looks like an awesome ball. And one of the interesting things is when I got a hold of this from Monty Green, who yep. owned the bowling alley at yep. the last, uh, the gold crown and the Brunswick were gone. And guess who got it for me? Oh, uh, Joe. Yep. Yeah, Joe. Joe's amazing. Uh, as far as what he's put together, we, we spent, like I say, probably six hours. But... <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, it was like... That's uh, about a minimum when you talk to Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but and, man, is it fun but, because it's but, full see, information. the odd thing is when I knew Joe, I thought he was very reserved. Uh, and I knew his dad very well because I used to play a lot of pool over there. And so, and his dad was always very, very good. But the boys, you know, low, uh, Joe is not over there playing pool, hanging out in the pool hall. He was studying or involved in sports yeah. and his parents, you know, so, yeah. so, but I was spending more time. Well, in, Joe, yeah. Joe has promised us one of his pool tables. I don't know if he'll follow through on No, he, he probably will. He will. Well, he will. Probably with multiples. <laughs> yeah. I sure love that. <laughs> At one time he said he thought he could get me the camp. Well, uh, tell me your first name again. Jeff. Jeff, okay. And Kenny. Jeff, Kenny and Manny. Manny. Manny, okay. And uh, it, this has really been a treat to, to see the museum. And CL suggested that we, we see it, and I'm impressed. Well, thank you. So, thank you. good job, great job, and we will see you again. I hope so. And, you know, it's only been less than a year that you've been set up in here. Open your doors, huh? The game of billiards was half. brought to this great country by the company of Brunswick. It was spread throughout the world along with not only the game, but a good, strong idea. The idea of bringing people together. Thank you for watching this documentary.